people live. You need to realize that there are more children attending segregated schools in the United States today than there were previous to Brown versus Board of Education, and that's a fact. You need to realize that it is not the intent of white people to let this situation change in favor of anyone but themselves. And right now, white people are really frightened. If you don't understand the destruction of Planned Parenthood uh, offices, and you don't understand the wall that we're going to build on the southern border of the United States, you haven't read the book The Birth Dearth by Ben Wattenberg. Ben Wattenberg was a brilliant Jewish man who was a member of the American Enterprise Institute. And he wrote a book, the first paragraph of which says, the main problem confronting the United States today is there aren't enough white babies being born in this country. He was an advisor to presidents of the United States. He wrote the book in 1987. He says, there are, if we don't change this and change it rapidly, white people will lose their numerical majority in this country and this will no longer be a white man's land. Now, I'm not misrepresenting this. I'm telling you exactly, almost exactly what he says. He says, there are three things we can do to solve this. Number one, we could pay women to have babies as they have been doing in Western European nations for years. Then he says, and these are his words, not mine, unfortunately, we would have to pay women of all colors to have babies, so we don't want to do that. He says the second thing we could do is increase the number of legal immigrants that are allowed into this country every year. Then once again he says, unfortunately the vast majority of those wanting to come to this country today are people of color, so we don't want to do that. The third thing he says, and white men, women had better pay attention to this, 60% of the fetuses that are aborted every year are white. If we could keep that 60% alive, that would solve our birth dearth. Does that sound like racism to you? And if it doesn't, I want to know why it doesn't. If it doesn't, you don't understand what racism is. And I think it does. When we close Planned Parenthood clinics, because we think they're there only for abortion, we need to take another look. They are used for many, many, many things, and many women need the things that they can get from Planned Parenthood clinics. But we are willing to do away with all that good to avoid allowing white women to have control of their own bodies. Now, nobody had better tell one of my daughters or granddaughters what they can do with their body. You haven't that right. Now, it would be interesting if we were as concerned about sperm cells, wouldn't it? Um, I mean, we could take a whole lot of fun out of you boys' lives. Right. Uh, a, a lot of people uh, don't understand a trauma associated with race and racism. Can you talk a little bit about the trauma associated with? The trauma associated with it? Yeah. One of the main traumas is it tells white people that they are superior because of the lack of melanin in their skin. And then they find out suddenly that we've got a black president. That's traumatic. That's where the trauma is. Living a lie, finding out the truth is traumatic. Finding out now recently that within 30 years, White people will be in the numerical minority in this country is going to be traumatic. And that's the reason we have to solve this problem and we have to solve it now. I will ask folks tonight, how many of you black folks want to get even with all white people? And that's what white people are quite certain blacks are going to want to do is get even with all white people. And nobody will raise their hand and then I'll say, how many of you want to get even with one or two? Every hand will go up and you know why and so do I. White people are scared to death right now, particularly white males. They're scared to death that they are going to lose their power in the future. And they are. But if you want to get ready for the future, if you want to be treated well in the future, treat others well in the present. What we do in the present constructs the future. What we have done in the past, we can learn from that. And we'd better learn from that. Those who forget the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat them. And when you read this book, you'll realize that that's exactly what we're doing. We're repeating the mistakes that we have made in the past because we aren't teaching about these mistakes in the present. We are not teaching history that is true. We aren't teaching social studies that is true. We aren't even teaching true geography, for God's sake. Have you seen the Mercator map recently? Have you seen that great big Greenland hanging down in the middle of that map like a ripe plum? And have you seen the legend at the bottom that says South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland? Were you aware of that? Most of those watching this program are not aware of that. You, you mentioned the wall several times in the at first we heard several things about the wall first. We, Mexico was going to pay for the wall and now, yeah, but you need to know that 70% of what Mr. Mr. Number 44 and a half said during that campaign wasn't true. 
And the wall business wasn't true either. If his mouth is moving, his lips are moving, he's probably lying. You know that as well as I do. He doesn't intend to build a wall. We can't afford to build that wall. We have no business building that wall. We would be keeping Americans out of America. What's your question? The question on the wall is there's, you know, when you talk to people about the wall, there are certain people about the wall. There's certain people for it, certain people against it. The people who are for it, what, what's their mindset? They're scared. They're afraid those people, those immigrants are going to come over here and take their jobs. Let me tell you something. You can build a wall, you can build a wall 50 feet tall and smart Hispanics, Latinos, smart Ecuadorians, smart others are going to tunnel under that wall and come up in their friend's house on the other side. You can build walls until hell freezes over. You will not keep that immigration from happening. And you better hope we don't keep that immigration from, from happening. We need those people. Do you know what will happen to the economy of this country if we take all the people who are brown-skinned immigrants out of this country, if we send them back? Do you know what will happen to our economy? Do you know what will happen to farming in California? Do you know what will happen to the price of your fruit? Do you know how hard it will be to get a good avocado? Do you have any idea what will happen to this country's economy if all those brown-skinned people go back to Mexico? I don't think we do. I don't think people have thought about that because they are being taught not to think. They are using a language. Right now, we are using a language that includes words like extremism and ugly language about people who are different from ourselves. People are listening to those words. They aren't listening to the philosophy behind them. They aren't listening to core principles, which this person has none of. Now, um, couple, just a couple more questions. Um, when we hear, uh, when, I, when I hear people say that they're not racist and, <laughs> and, and things like that, and we talk about building racial harmony in this country, I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime. Can you predict in the near future or far future when we will ever have uh, racial harmony oh, in this yeah. country? Oh yeah, in 30 years, white people will have, will have found out that they have no, no, no choice but to get along with those who are different from themselves. I'm not willing, I'd love to wait, but I can't. At my age, I'm not gonna be here in 30 years. But we could change this situation if we chose to. During, during the Second World War, we called the Japanese, and you'll pardon me, but this is what we called them, slant-eyed little yellow mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We didn't say that about the Germans. After the war, we rebuilt Germany and Japan, and we get along beautifully with the Japanese. That was in 1945 that we finally won that war. How, ma how many years ago was that? Figure that out quickly. I'm not a math person, but... You're not a math time. person, but you know it wasn't that far. Right. And it didn't take 50 years for us to, to have peace with the Japanese and the Germans, even though, even though we dropped two atomic bombs on Japan. The Japanese hadn't killed 10 million people. Nowhere near that. We didn't drop any bombs on Germany, we could, any, any atomic bombs on Germany. They were a different kind of people. We couldn't afford to do that. We killed how many Japanese people with two atomic bombs? And they forgave us. You want to talk about forgiveness? You want to talk about changing this thing? I cannot understand how Japanese people can stand the sight of any of us, and yet they do. I cannot understand why black people who have been subjected to the ugliness that they've been subjected to in this country can get up every morning and go to work among us and not be absolutely furious. And I don't understand why we allow white people to behave the way they do. I don't understand that. And my third graders, after they'd gone through the exercise, couldn't understand it and wouldn't tolerate it. And when they went up to junior high and a junior high teacher used the N-word, one of my, my former students said, if you're going to use that word, I'm going to go out in the hall until you stop using it because we don't use that word in this school. That was a, sixth, a seventh grader who told his teacher off, when we have enough students who are willing to confront people who are making racist, sexist, ageist, homophobic statements, we're going to be better off. We have got to stop tolerating the intolerable.